Happy Halloween. Uh, okay, let's, you ready? Get started. We talked about uh, the traveling point heat source, the Rosenthal solution, and said it's a good approximate model of heat flow and welding. And I'll go over that in a second. We also talked about there are numerous important differences in how lasers and electron beams interact with solids. Um, and I'm going to finish up some of that today. But let's go back to this point heat source. If I start looking at the cross section of well pools, um, and it turns out to be important for a number of reasons. If I'm welding on something thin, like, like a thin wall pipe, and I'm, I can't weld from both sides because they can't get inside the pipe uh, to weld, I want to get a good weld without burning through on the back side. Uh, so I'm concerned about how much penetration I'm going to get, how deep the well pool is. The traveling point source solution, if we have a point source of heat here, and I don't have any convection or anything else, it's just straight conduction, then I always get a semicircular shaped well pool. And so one of the things the traveling point source solution doesn't give you is any information about the shape of that well pool. It's always got a depth to width ratio of a, of a half, okay? Because it's R over 2R, so it's always a half. Now, the traveling distributed heat source, and typically people have used the Gaussian distribution of heat because that's a reasonable approximation to what the arc actually produces. Um, that will always give you something with the depth to width ratio of less than a half. Because if I'm spreading the heat source out, it's going to make things wider. It's not going to make things any deeper. And for very low currents, like below 100 amps in gas tugs and arc welding, that may not be a bad approximation. However, if I look at most well pools, I actually find my depth to width ratio is greater than a half. It may not be greater than one. In a few cases in arc welding, it might be greater than one at very high currents. But in fact, uh, it's certainly greater than a half, and so neither the point source solution or the um, uh, distributed source solution really tell you what the shape of the well pool is going to be. And in fact, it's still uh, a matter of contention among people, but we do know that there are cases where convection, if we've got the, the hottest, uh, well, actually, you could say the hottest, there's three forces driving the convection in the well pool. There's buoyancy. And the hottest material would be in the center, and that actually should drive flow up and out to the sides. It should give you a well pool that looks like this. And sometimes that, that we see that, but not because of buoyancy. There are electromagnetic forces. Which is basically the same Lorentz force. The current is being distributed, and I have a higher current density up here than it does as it spreads out within the material. And that creates the pumping action that we talked about with plasma jets. It creates that in the liquid. And that gives me convection down this way, which takes the hottest material and brings it towards the bottom. And convection's carrying hot material to the bottom and digs a deeper hole. And we see well pools of that shape. Uh, typically, if I go to gas tungsten arc welding above 100 amps, I might start seeing the electromagnetic forces predominate. But, um, it turns out. If you do some calculations, you'll find buoyancy might drive the flow at uh, a centimeter a second. Electromagnetic might drive it, uh, if you're in the 100 to 200 ampere range, might drive it at uh, 10 centimeters a second. But the real force is Marangoni flow. And Marangoni was an Italian physicist of, of the 19th century who basically uh, pointed out that if I have a surface tension gradient across the material and it's hottest in the center and it gets cooler to the side, typically surface tension will decrease um, with, with increasing temperature. So I have a higher surf te surface tension up here over on the edges than here. So this will be low surface tension and this will be high surface tension, high gamma over here on the sides. And that will tend to drive the flow opposite of electromagnetic. And if you do the calculations, and I gave you a paper that we published back in the early 80s, that will drive this at about a meter per second. For a typical well pool with very steep temperature gradients, 
because what's driving this is the temperature differential from here to here across the surface of the well pool. And you've got about 1,000 degrees centigrade over a few millimeters. So that's a very steep temperature gradient. You get very strong Marangoni convection, probably some of the strongest Marangoni convection that anyone's ever, ever seen in, in welding. And that can change the well pool to make it look like this. Or it turns out if you get what we call surface active elements, like sulfur in steel or oxygen in steel, you can actually get Marangoni flows that reverse and look like the electromagnetic flows. And so it turns out, particularly in gas tungsten arc welding, you can take two different heats of steel, and one of them will weld like this, and the other one will weld like this, even though you have absolutely identical processing parameters. In the mid-1980s, this was the biggest problem in the stainless steel industry. As steels were getting purer and purer, they were starting to have variabilities in their Marangoni flow behavior. In the old days, when steels had lots of sulfur, like 250 parts per million, you always got this type of flow. You always got relatively deep penetration, got consistent weld behavior. As the steels got purer and purer and purer, some of them were clean enough to start giving you this type of flow, which would basically, before I was talking about just straight conduction, but you have Marangoni flows up and out rather than down and in, right? The different convection in the well pools could give you three, four hundred percent difference in penetration. So if I had, I could have a, an eighth inch uh, thick well zone or sheet, and I could have uh, terrible penetration that wouldn't go all the way through, and then I could put in another coil of steel into the exact same automatic welding procedure. You know, it's not human variability at all. This is all mechanized, and I have the thing burn through. The way I bought my first car was on a case where a company was built, was making stainless steel beer kegs, <clears throat> and uh, they ran into this problem. And they made 75% uh, of their beer kegs were defective. I mean, they only made about a half a million of them, but 75% but of them were defective because they didn't know about this problem. In the mid-1980s, steel companies were throwing sulfur back into the steel to try to dirty it up so it would weld consistently like this. And it's still a problem. It's not just in stainless steels. It was first observed in zirconium alloys in nuclear reactors. Um, it occurs in titanium alloys. It occurs in virtually any material in the temperature range below 200 amps. Once you get above 200 amps, you actually get deep penetration, and you actually get funny shaped weld pools like this. But it's because while you're welding, you actually get a surface depression. And you actually dig a hole, and then material will build up around the sides, and you'll get, when you finally, everything settles out and the, the liquid floats back in, you end up with a, with a weld that has a final shape, which is sometimes called finger penetration, because you've got a finger sticking down here. But you get a weld pool shape that looks like that. That's a problem if, if my joint happens to be over here, I'm going to get lack of fusion. If I'm welding two plates together and the joint is here, but my finger penetration is over here, I'm going to miss the penetration. And I see that type of missed penetration uh, probably once a year in some sort of uh, lack of fusion defect because the joint got missed because of this type of thing. So it turns out shapes of well pools have been an active area of research for the last 30 years and probably will be for the next 30 years or more. Um, it does lead to defects. There's all kinds of insidious behavior, um, like these, uh, what happened in the beer kegs that also happened in, in lots of other problems. And I don't hear about the problem so much anymore. Um, I used to get phone calls once or twice a year about someone saying, we can't, we can't get our steel to weld properly. You know, we can't get consistent welding. I started asking them questions. And it turns out it's due to the convection in the well pool. Uh, one solution has been to add sulfur dioxide to your shielding gas, but now it smells like rotten eggs when you're welding. Okay, plus uh, your welders are now breathing a little sulfurous acid. Right? Um, that's only a little. I mean, it's no well, it's no worse than going to the men's room around here, um, uh, particularly without the ventilation that we have in these old buildings. Um, but in any case. Um, 
there are various uh, tricks to try to try to solve the problem and get consistent welding. Um, yeah. There are, but they're not worth anything. Because to actually simulate the whole welding process with the convection and everything else is, um, it's really beyond the capability of computers today. I mean, if you just want to do a heat flow ca capability, you can go buy any commercial heat flow analysis software package and you can plug in the Rosenthal equation, which is, you know, you can do that in MATLAB, right? Um, um, or something like that, or Maple or something. Um, if you want to get a convection heat flow problem, you can solve it, but we don't know the thermophysical properties, exactly what this temperature gradient is. And so you can get any number you want. You can get any whirlpool shape you want. You can't predict, you don't have predictive capability yet. And if you actually get into, and you want to solve the thermomechanical problem, whether the residual stresses in the weld, forget it. That problem is beyond computers for at least another 30 years. If you actually start looking at the what's called the thermoelastic plastic thermoelastic plastic problem, you basically have to do so many iterations and so many time steps that even the biggest computers can't even come close to tackling that problem right now. You actually have to do a full three-dimensional analysis. People have always been doing two-dimensional analyses because it simplifies the computation. But it turns out two-dimensional analyses can be proved to be inaccurate in terms of distortion and residual stresses. Uh, nonetheless, people do it. They publish papers on it now. And typically, when I see such a paper, I go to the conclusion, see if, you know, if it's a 2D residual stress calculation. When I'm reviewing it, I basically go to the conclusion, see if it says anything that I didn't know before. And then I basically can the paper because a 2D residual stress calculation is worthless, OK? Uh, it's not too hard, you know, when, when pick, so when someone uh, chooses a problem that can be solved rather than that one that is of, of real scientific interest, then I don't consider it much of a contribution. Um, and that has to do with, go back to Theodore von Karman, a scientist explains that which exists, an engineer creates that which never was. Well, um, many people will choose problems that can be solved, not that should be solved, okay? Just because you can solve a problem with some computer code doesn't mean that it has any simulation of reality. And it turns out the, the heat flow problem in welding is a true three-dimensional problem. And when you try to simplify it to a two-dimensional problem, you've oversimplified it. As Einstein said, as simple as possible, but no simpler. And when you go down to two dimensions, you are simpler than possible to get a useful result. So there are programs. Um, but frankly, you will do just as well with good old Rosenthal, or if you want to get a little fancier, the Green's function, which you can do in MATLAB or Maple without any difficulty. You'll do just as well with those. You'll get within 10 to 20 percent of the right answer. And if you want to get with any closer than that, you're not going to do it in today's world. And probably not in the world, uh, maybe in your lifetime, but not in my lifetime. Okay. Yeah. Oh, well, the easiest way to think of it is a, as a surface energy. If I have less energy, if the liquid here has less energy than here, then it's going to try to replace that, that energy on the surface. Okay, so it actually creates a shear force. But physically, it's a lowering of the, of the Gibbs free energy by displacing the surface material that has a high surface energy by a material that has a low surface energy. So it always flows in the direction of low surface energy to high surface energy. But it can reverse because if it's purely a, a thermal Marangoni, so that the, the lowest surface energy is in the center and the highest is over here because it's cooler, then it flows that way. But if it's a chemical Marangoni, the surface absorption is greater over here and you get hotter and you boil off those impurity atoms like sulfur on the surface and it flip flops. The gradient flips of surface energy flip flops, and you have the highest in the center and the lowest on the edge. And so the flow reverses. And actually, some of the interesting things people will, uh, 20 years ago, actually 23 years ago now, people took a high sulfur steel plate and a low sulfur steel plate. The low one would weld like 
this, and the high one would, would have a penetration like this. And when you put the two of them together, you would get a well pool that was asymmetric like that. And you had low penetration on the high penetration side and deep penetration. Why? Because now the flow was not two, two loops, but you now had a gradient all the way across this going from low surface energy to high surface energy, driving a single loop like this. And so they actually took two plates and welded them together. If you want, I should have, could have brought the picture of this, published in 1979, before we really understood what was going on. You get some really weird convection effects because of these differences in surface chemistry and uh, surface temperature gradient. Okay? So that's Marangoti flow and convection. Any, any other questions? Okay. Let's uh, finish up in the last couple of minutes here. Uh, we were talking about differences in heating with lasers and electron beams, and basically, electron beams, the particles have much higher energies by like a factor of 50,000 than the photons. And we went through a number of reasons. I think we got down here and we said that electron beams were nearly 100% heat efficient. They deposit their heat slightly beneath the surface. You're going so fast that you don't have time to create a big heat effective zone with heat diffusing away until after the heat zone is passed. So while you're putting it in, you're basically putting it in adiabatically. It's going into a cold plate, and you don't have time to diffuse away while you're depositing it. It turns out that lasers are kind of funny in that they're nearly 100% uh, uh, efficient on ceramics, although they may be partially transparent on ceramics. Uh, and so they may deposit beneath the surface. But on silver, copper, and gold, uh, sil silver, copper, gold, and aluminum, I didn't put silver down there, um, they're very inefficient. Of course, that means that <coughs> kind of the, there's always an exception that proves the rule. Uh, that means that laser welding of aluminum is very difficult because 95% of the power is being reflected away because the aluminum is acting like a mirror. And so, uh, in general, if you try to weld, laser weld on aluminum, you get a very unstable process because in order to get the deep penetration with laser welding of aluminum, you have to put in 10 to the 7th watts per square centimeter in order to get 10 to the 6th in, okay? Because you're losing 90% of it or more by radiation or, you know, just uh, radiating away. But however, once I get a deep depression, and the laser light is now going beneath the surface. Now, the ra some of it's radiating away to the sidewalls. And in fact, now the coupling goes up from 5% to maybe 30, 40, 50, or 60, or 70%. And now I'm putting in 10 to the 7th. So I start out by putting in 10 to the 7th, but only getting 10 to the 6th in. That creates a surface depression. Then the laser is now going into the surface depression, which acts like a back black body. So it's got near 100% absorption. Now I'm putting in too much power. And I just blast everything apart. So if you laser weld on a, uh, on a piece of aluminum, you'll get intermittent weld, non-weld, you know, weld, drilled hole, weld, drilled hole. And so people generally say you can't laser weld aluminum, at least not very efficiently. That's not to say some people don't. However, the interesting thing is a number of years ago, I don't know if it's still true, the world's largest application of laser welding happened to be on aluminum. And it happened to be, if not in this building, but if you go to a new building and you look at double pane windows, you'll see here's one pane of glass and here's another pane of glass. And in between, they will have this little aluminum spacer. And the aluminum spacer, they basically take a piece of aluminum sheet and form it this way to hold the two pieces of glass apart. So you look down, you know, in a new building, you look in the double pane windows, and you'll see, a, if I give some three-dimensional nature to this, you'll see on that seam a series of intermittent welds. That was done with a continuous beam, laser beam. And it's the inherent instability of the laser welding process. And back, I don't know, the last time I talked to these folks was over 10 years ago, they were welding a couple hundred million feet a year of this, okay, to make the frames for double pane windows because they didn't want a hermetic seal in the joint. 
you have changes in atmospheric pressure and you want to equilibrate, and so you actually want a little bit of air to leak back and forth to equilibrate the pressure. You don't want to put, have a higher pressure inside because pushing the glass out or pushing the glass in, you'll get, you'll get fatigue of the glass and it'll break. So you want to equilibrate the pressure, so you want small leaks. And that's the perfect type of thing for aluminum welding, laser welding. You've produced small leaks. If you look at these things, and whenever I'm in a building, I don't have anything to do, a newer building, I always go up to look at it. It's amazing how uniform it is. You would think that someone is using a pulsed laser to do this, but they're not. Some place in Illinois, they have 10 or 12 laser welders just, just pumping this stuff out by the mile. And all because it's an unstable process. And it works just great. So, just an exception that proves the rule. When someone says you can't laser weld aluminum, that's why the reason, the physics behind it, is the reason why the largest application of laser welding in the world that I know of, at least in linear feet of weld, happens to be on aluminum. Okay, um, electron beam. The beam is distorted by magnetic fields. That can be good because I can apply an oscillating magnetic field and I can essentially scan and over an area very rapidly. I can get 10 kilohertz scan speeds, which allows you to take a sharply focused beam and essentially use it as a distributed heat source and do heat treating with a laser welder if I wanted. A laser is unaffected by fields that we have to worry about. What fields will affect a laser? Gravitational fields on a cosmic scale, right? Light bends, according to Einstein, right? But uh, we don't have to worry about that, unless you're welding over long distances. Okay, um, now, the beam is distorted by magnetic fields. One of the biggest problems in electron beam welding of heavy plate, and one of the reasons it's not used in certain types of situations, is if I have two different steels, let's say uh, they don't have to be radically different, but let's say this one's a stainless steel and this is just a carbon steel, and I want to weld these together, and they're, they're several inches thick. If I put a, try to put a weld in there, it turns out there will be a temperature difference between these two metals, which are dissimilar metals. If they were the same metal, I'll get a weld that looks just like I showed you. But in fact, because of the composition difference and the temperature that's across here, I have basically set up a thermo, the thermoelectric effect. Essentially, I make a thermocouple. The thermocouple produces a voltage, and the voltage produces currents, eddy currents, in the material. The eddy currents produce magnetic fields, and the beam will distort. And you'll get a weld pool, and you'll miss the bottom of your joint. You can get, most beams are, are good enough that you go through one inch thick plate, but you wanna go more than one inch, and you're gonna find your beam distorts when you try to electron beam weld on dissimilar materials because of the internally generated magnetic fields due to this thermoelectric effect. Not thermoelectric, thermo, what is it? Seebeck effect, isn't it, for thermocouples? Anyway, it's a thermoelectric phenomenon, how shall we say. Um, problem with electron beam is it produces x-rays. Now, there are basically two sizes of electron beam machines up to about um, 50 kilovolts, and then they kind of go, they jump all the way up to 100 kilovolts. And the reason for that primarily is the amount of x-rays produced. I gotta do the whole thing inside a vacuum, and 40 kilovolt x-rays can be stopped by just a regular old vacuum chamber, just regular, regular old glass or slightly leaded glass, no, no special thickness, and just the walls the metal walls of the vacuum chamber will, will protect me from 40 kilovolt elect, uh, x-rays that are generated by the electron beam. When I go to 60 or 70 or 80 kilovolts, then I'm gonna generate hard enough x-rays, they will go through, and I'm gonna irradiate my workers unless I start putting extra shielding around the electron beam machine, like lead shielding. It doesn't have to be more than half an inch thick, but a 100 kilovolt electron beam machine will have lead shielding around the steel case of the vacuum chamber, and the glass portholes will be leaded glass an inch or two inches thick because you've got to cut down the hard x-rays. Um, so it turns out 
the cost of building a high voltage power supply, it doesn't cost you that much more. It's just a ratio of turns windings to a certain extent to go from 50 kilovolts to 100 kilovolts. If you're going to have to put lead shielding on there, they kind of go all the way up to 100 kilovolts because there are certain advantages to focusing at 100 kilovolts. It's easier to focus for the reason we'll get down to the next one. But because of this, you find two classes of ele electron beam machines, the low voltage ones, typically below 50 kilovolts, and the high voltage ones above 100 kilovolts, and not a whole lot in the intermediate, intermediate range, mostly because of the expense of shielding the whole, the whole thing. Um, it turns out the problem with the laser is it's infrared radiation. You can't see the beam. Even, even helium neon lasers, if I had brought a laser pointer with me, you can't see the beam going across here unless I happen to have a foggy room. Okay? When I show you pictures, you know, in, in some photonics magazine on the cover and you see laser light going between this optical bench and stuff, they had to have a fog generator in that room. They have to set their lenses just right so you see everything else clear. You see the laser light, but the only reason you see the laser light is because it's reflecting off the, the fog particles. Okay? So um, you can't see laser light until it reflects off of something, and it doesn't reflect off the air. I mean, just take a laser pointer. You don't see the beam until it hits, hits the wall. Um, so the problem is you've got enough laser energy, obviously, that you can seriously uh, uh, hurt someone if it, you know, if it hits them. So, <coughs> so the whole laser can operate it in, uh, in the atmosphere, but you've got to have all kinds of inner safety interlocks so no one walks into this invisible beam. So you typically have gates and everything else and buzzers and everything. The other problem is the human eye. And the human eye, this is supposed to represent an eye, right? The human eye, when light comes in, it gets focused. So it takes relatively low laser energy to damage the retina because you've got a magnifying glass. Remember burning ants on the sidewalks with a magnifying glass as a kid? Or starting paper on fire? If you don't want to claim you're burning ants. Um, uh, you're focusing the light. It doesn't take very much reflected light. And so typically you should be well wearing special glasses that are designed to, to absorb the radiation without shattering. Um, actually, I was going to tell you something about this 100% heat efficient. Um, this one here, when we talked about laser, laser is nearly 100% efficient in absorption on ceramics, but it's reflected by, by aluminum. Um, well, it's probably 15 years ago, 16 years ago, someone from uh, Division of Johnson & Johnson came in that I'd been consulting with them for, I still do, for a number of years. And they make, they make medical instruments for general surgery, neurosurgery, OBGYN, this particular division is outside of Boston here, and has been here. They used to, they used to make the Civil War surgeon's kits, and you know, the bone saws and things like that. They actually in their lobby have one of these kits from the Civil War. It looks like a carpenter's kit, but anyway. Um, in any case, they, uh, uh, the guy was part of the industrial liaison program, and he wanted to drop off a sample I was going to look at, and he, and he uh, he said, I'll, I'll drive it by your office. And he came by and said, what are you doing here, John? He says, oh, I'm going down to the physics department to talk to them about uh, absorption of lasers, by lasers. I said, why are you doing that? He says, oh, we use lasers for surgery now. We want to make instruments so that the light doesn't reflect off the instrument and burn somebody in a place where the surgeon doesn't intend. I mean, the, the metal instrument is a mirror, right? And so if, you, if the surgeon misses the tissue and hits the instrument, you don't want it reflecting off and burning something else that you didn't intend to burn. Sort of makes sense. I said, so who are you talking to? He says, oh, I'm going down to the kind of meeting with the people in the physics department. I said, physics? He says, what's the matter? I said, oh, no, no, never mind. Just, just have a good trip. He came back 15 minutes later, shaking his head. I said, oh, so you met with him? He said, yeah. I said, uh, well, what did they say? He said, well, I told them I needed something that absorbed the laser light. And they told me everything absorbs laser light. Because to a physicist, it doesn't matter whether it's 5% or 100%. There's some absorption there, right? We're not worried about the details, right? <clears throat> so I said, well, OK, John, why don't we sit down and talk about it, what your problem is? Well, it turns out he wanted to absorb the radiation and carry the heat away. Because in this particular case, they wanted to, uh, uh, it was very fine scale surgery. And you actually were using one material as the backstop to the laser through some very thin tissue. And so he, uh, 
he wanted to absorb the light, but the, the part that he was doing was so small he couldn't have a big, massive backstop. He had to carry the heat away quickly. Otherwise, the backstop would get hot as it absorbed the energy, and then you just cauterize everything, <laughs> okay? You just dry it up, you know, and it would stick. It would adhesively bond once you get rid of your solvent, which was water in this case, right? It adhesively bond. Remember, proteins are good adhesives. So I said, well, you know, <coughs> you really, it's too bad you can't use aluminum for instruments. He says, what do you mean? We make aluminum instruments all the time. I said, well, then you ought to use anodized aluminum because you have a ceramic surface, which is aluminum oxide, which has nearly 100% heat absorption. And then you have the thermal conductivity of aluminum, which will carry the heat away very quickly. So we ended up with two patents on this wonderful composite material. We didn't write it just on an anodized aluminum. You had to have a material on the surface that was composite with a surface coating that would absorb laser light, a non-electrical conductor. And then a material that had very good thermal conductivity. You could use copper, except it's toxic in the body. Or you could use silver, or you could use gold, or you could use aluminum. And so the, the material of choice was anodized aluminum. We actually ran some tests, and we could absorb pulses for one or two seconds that had the equivalent of 100,000 watts per square centimeter on anodized aluminum without doing any serious damage to the surface. Okay. Now these were just pulses. If we ran them continuously, we'd have, we would have blown it apart eventually. But, but uh, anyway, we ended up with two patents on anodized aluminum. Uh, the current is limited in electron beam to about a half an amp. And the reason it is, if I go up to an amp in the electron beam, and I'm using magnetic fields to focus this, turns out the electrons, if you go through the calculation of the speed, these, these electrons are getting up towards the relativistic speed. But even so, there's enough of them that they're actually getting close enough together at one amp that you're starting to get mutual repulsion. So you might be trying to squeeze them together, but they're repelling each other. And the beam will automatically defocus. So if you want to get a sharp focus on your beam for welding, which you do, you can't go above about a half an amp, or the electrons will essentially mutually repel themselves and defocus. Now, for electron beam melting machines, they use 3 and 4 and 10 amps. But they don't care. They're just trying to get a beam that's this big around. Okay? They're trying to melt something. When you're trying to do precision laser welding, you can't go above about a half an amp. In the aluminum, you get the diffraction spots. And I passed this thing around last time. And you can feel the pebbly surface here, which basically are uh, due, due to the different modes of, of the laser. Um, I mentioned it's easy to manipulate the beam by magnets with um, lasers that's done with mirrors. Or increasingly, in the last five to 10 years, the quality of fiber optics, in terms of their loss, has gotten to be so good, you can now put one kilowatt of power down a fiber optic without blowing it apart. In the old days, if you went back to the 1980s, the fiber optics absorption, even if they only absorbed half the power, I mean, half a percent of the power, that's still 20 watts out of a or 50 watts out of a thousand, right? And that would start to heat up the fiber optics. The the absorption levels of the fiber optics are so good now that you can actually start transmitting uh, a kilowatt or more. And so now you can bring lasers to the workpiece just through a little cable, and that has actually been kind of a revolution in terms of practical use of lasers because it's much easier to bring the beam to the to the workpiece. The sample heats very uniformly with electron beam. These particles have so much more energy than the binding energy, the atoms, or the different types of things, that they heat up everything uniformly. With the laser, you actually can preferentially heat ceramic materials. Um, the Navy found when they welded on HY80 steel with a, with a high power laser 20 years ago, they actually refined the steel. The, the ceramic inclusions in the steel would preferentially be heated and vaporized while you're melting the steel at a regular rate. The steel has about a 30% reflect, uh, reflectivity. The ceramic has a near zero reflectivity and absorbs all the power. I remember, well, when well, it's probably more than 10 years ago now, people were looking at aluminum silicon carbide metal matrix composites. And they, uh, they uh, called me up, or the company that made these called me up and said, we'd like you to do some laser welding on this. I said, no. He said, we'd like to give you a $50,000 research grant to do laser welding on this. I said, no, I don't want to do it. If you want, you can go to Ohio State. I'm sure they'll take the money. 
and they did. <laughs> they went to Ohio State. My, I told them who to go to, and the Ohio State took the money. Then the interesting thing is the student who had applied, he used to work as a technician for the Navy, he'd applied to MIT, he didn't get in, and he went to Ohio State, and then he calls me up, he says, how do I do this? <laughs> So, uh, great. I, got, I said, you know, I turned that contract down. And the reason is, I got aluminum, I got silicon carbide particles which have nearly 100% absorption. Okay, I made this composite by, by putting like 30, 10, 20, 30% ceramic inside an aluminum matrix. And with a laser, I'm going to get 100% absorption on those particles, and I'm going to get 5% absorption on the aluminum. So I'm going to have a very non-uniform heating, and you're basically going to blast some things apart with 100% absorption of the laser light, and you're gonna have a hard time melting the other stuff. Aside from the fact you're also, when you heat the silicon carbide that hot, you're gonna form aluminum carbide, and aluminum carbide mix, mixes with water and decomposes into aluminum oxide and, um, and uh, 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 I guess, CO or CO2, I don't know. Um, but in any case, it's very hydroscopic, and basically you're, the whole thing will corrode on you. Uh, with a little bit of moisture. So anyway, the, the student did end up getting a thesis, but it is not a practical process. I knew it wouldn't be a practical process. I told them why it wouldn't be a practical process, but they wanted to do the research anyway. And so they did. You'll, you'll always find someone who will take your money, okay? Um, but I didn't think it would be a very interesting thesis to know it was going to be a failure in the beginning, okay? But anyway. Um, okay, we need to do course evaluations here. We can go ahead and turn that off. Thank you.